Well, thank you very much, Philip, and thank you, Vanessa, for our readings this morning. If you have a Bible uh, with you or a copy of the service, do keep it open at John chapter 2, as we come today to the fourth in our series, series of sermons in John's Gospel. But as we turn to God's word, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, the Bible. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher today as we read it, and that you would inspire, challenge, and encourage us through it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was looking at the um, Sunday Times, uh, no, the Saturday Times uh, magazine the other day. Um, it's not the most recent one. Naomi gets uh, annoyed with me because I insist on having the paper on Saturday and then sometimes take three weeks to read it. And so they stack up uh, in the lounge uh, and make a mess. But I was looking at this particular Saturday Times uh, magazine and I came across um, this advert. It's a couple of wine glasses and it says on it, you can taste when it's Waitrose. Uh, wines are available from other suppliers, I, I should add. The thing that really interested me is that on the other page, it's a full page spread. On this side, it says you can taste when it's from our vineyard in Hampshire. You can taste when it's from our vineyard in Hampshire. And if you look at the small print, um, it tells you that Waitrose Hampshire Vineyard is at Leckford. Leckford, which is just this side of Stockbridge, you probably know, in the Test Valley. Well, wine has become quite a thing, hasn't it, in Hampshire? There are lots of places uh, these days where there are vineyards and where wine is grown. And by all accounts, um, the conditions here in England are very similar to those in the Champagne region in France. Nice, gentle, south-facing slopes with chalk underneath, so well-drained. And um, apparently, we are making wine as good as they're making in the Champagne region. I don't know much about wine. You might want to argue with that, but that's what they say. And certainly, Waitrose are proud of their English wine. Where I grew up in Medstead, not that far from here, but in the opposite direction, many of the south facing slopes are now covered in vines. Our Bible passage today is all about wine. And though it's a coincidence, it seemed to me that it was a very fitting reading for Rogation Sunday when we ask God's blessing on the produce of the land. Back in Medstead, in the village there, we had a custom where at Rogation Tide, we would walk around the village and through the footpaths which crisscrossed the village on Rogation Sunday and stop and pray at various points along the route for the animals, for the crops and for the work of our farmers. And that included praying in the vineyards. Our story today takes place in Cana in Galilee. And I showed you last week a map. I thought I'd just show you that again very briefly so that you have some idea where Cana was. So here you see the Sea of Galilee. And I've put a um, uh, a marker at the bottom there to show you what 25 miles looks like. All these places were sort of within 25 miles of each other uh, and surrounding the Sea of Galilee. This was the region of Galilee. It's in the north of Israel. Uh, remember the Dead Sea and Jerusalem, uh, 75 miles or so south of here. And you can see there where Jesus grew up at Nazareth, where um, the fishermen came from Bethsaida, that's where Andrew and Peter came from, and Philip, another one of the disciples. 
And then we have the town of Cana, where the wedding is taking place. And although I didn't tell you this last week, Nathaniel, who we were speaking about last week, Nathaniel comes from Cana. How do I know that that's where he came from? Because John tells us in the last chapter of John, chapter 21, um, that that's where Nathaniel was. When he's listing the disciples after the resurrection, when they went out fishing, he calls him Nathaniel from Cana. So Nathaniel was from Cana, and none of those places are very far apart. Thank you, Philip. Thanks. It may have been because of Nathaniel that they were all at the wedding, but it's more likely it was because of Jesus' mother. And that's because she has a fairly prominent part uh, in this story. Uh, we read at the beginning, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. It seems that she was uh, a good friend or something to do with the couple who were getting married she was concerned uh, about um, the hospitality that was being offered. And she came to Jesus with that concern. It's a well-known story. And we know what happens. But at first, uh, Jesus seems slightly reluctant to act, doesn't he? He says to her, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come but she still says to the servants she knows something's going to happen do whatever he tells you why would Jesus be reluctant to act this was the very start of his ministry he'd only called six of his disciples that's only half of the disciples at this point and these were early days Jesus didn't want, I guess, to make too much of a stir early on and arouse um, uh, suspicion or um, his enemies. But we know that Jesus goes on in this miracle to turn water into wine. And not just any wine, but the very best wine. As the uh, master of ceremony said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. One of the interesting things about this miracle is that it is only recorded in John's Gospel. I have no idea why that is, but it says to me that John was almost certainly there, that this was an eyewitness account. And that would be borne out by the fact that he was one of the first six disciples. This is an eyewitness account of Jesus' very first miracle. But what really struck me about this passage is the contrast between this story and chapter one of John. For the last three weeks, we've been looking at chapter one. And in chapter one, John sets the scene for the whole of his gospel. He refers, if you remember, right at the start to Jesus as the eternal word, the one who has existed right from the beginning, the one through whom the world was made. And then he goes on, we looked at this in week two, to speak about Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then last week, uh, we saw how Jesus himself refers to himself as the gateway to heaven. You will see the angels of God ascending and descending, he said, upon the Son of Man. And there in chapter one, they are all big themes that John is bringing us big pictures that John is painting of who Jesus was. 
It's like his executive summary, which he's putting right at the start about Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. And then we come to this week, to chapter two and to the wedding at Cana. A very family affair, an ordinary human occasion, a joyful one, a wedding. Having told us that Jesus is the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, it's as though John wants us to know as well that Jesus was a human being like you and me. Fully God, but fully man. He wants us to know that Jesus could enjoy a party. That Jesus liked the things of everyday life. And yet, even in this human story, Jesus' miracle points beyond his humanity to his divinity. I've mentioned before uh, in uh, talking to you that John doesn't refer to miracles in his gospel. All the miracles in John are called signs. Signs. And signs point to something, don't they? They tell us something. They give us information or send us in a certain direction. What was this sign, this miracle, pointing to? Surely it points to the fact that Jesus was the creator. Because only a creator God could turn water into wine. It backs up that claim which John has made right there in the first few verses of his gospel in chapter one, where he says Jesus was the creative word. Nothing was made, he says, that was not made through him. And this is a sign of that truth when Jesus turns water into wine. And that is surely why John says that through this miracle, Jesus' glory was revealed. He says that right at the end. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first sign through which he revealed his glory. And what was the result? The disciples believed in him. What does John want the result to be for us? He wants us to believe too. I'm going to leave you with this story, which uh, I found in one of the commentaries on this passage. It's quite an old story, I think, but still worth hearing. It's about um, a miner in Wales who had a problem with drink. And this particular miner was converted to Christianity. And a result of his conversion was that he stopped drinking. He stopped drinking altogether. One of his friends asked him one day, possibly trying to test him, do you believe that Jesus turned water into wine? The miner thought for a moment and then he answered, well, in my house, he has turned wine into furniture, decent clothes, and food for my family. In my house, he has turned wine into furniture, decent clothes, and food for my family. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the miracle of the water into wine. And we pray that as you were glorified in this sign, so you would be glorified in our lives. We ask in your name. Amen.